Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, The Benefits of Service Dogs to Individuals Living with EDS and HSD, with Ellen Lennox-Smith. My name is Sarah Jo Ritchie. I am the volunteer coordinator at the Ehlers Danlos Society, and I am your moderator today. This webinar is a part of our ongoing series, Living with EDS and HSD. So this is how today's webinar is going to work. Webinar attendees will be muted at all times during the webinar. However, you are able to type any questions you may have throughout the presentation into the question box at any time. Ellen will not be able to see or respond to any questions until the Q&A portion at the end of their presentation. Please do not send your questions more than once. It will not increase your chances of having your question answered. It will only make it harder for us to sift through the questions and to make sure we are able to answer as many as possible. Ellen Lennox-Smith has emerged as a leading patient voice for patients living with pain. Featured in local and national press accounts, Mrs. Smith brings a reasoned and compassionate perspective to the need for safe patient access to medicine. Mrs. Smith suffers from two rare, presently incurable conditions, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and sarcoidosis, enduring 24 surgeries. Mrs. Smith has enjoyed a career in the field of education. Presently, she is a Rhode Island ambassador for the U.S. Pain Foundation as co-director for Cannabis Advocacy on the board of both the U.S. Pain Foundation and the Rhode Island Patient Advocacy Coalition. Appointed by the governor both to the ATEL program, which is the Adaptive Telephone Equipment Loan Program, and represents patients on the oversight panel in Rhode Island that oversees the medical marijuana program. She helps run a Rhode Island EDS support group. She is a staff writer for the National Pain Report and 1000 Watts Magazine. She's the author of two books, It Hurts Like Hell, I Live With Pain, and Have a Good Life Anyway, and My Life as a Service Dog. Mrs. Smith is a resident of Rhode Island with her husband, Stuart, and parents to four sons and four grandchildren. Ellen was a master swimmer and high school swim coach. Thank you so much, Ellen, and welcome. Thank you very much, and welcome to everybody that's joining us today. I would like to just begin that we all have to give our disclosure. I have absolutely no financial ties with anything. Uh, everything I do is to literally pay it forward in hopes that each of us uh, will lessen the journey of some of the horror we've all been through with this condition, waiting to be diagnosed and so on. So everything my husband and I do is totally um, just to share and to pass forward and on a volunteer basis. Um, so I'm going to start today a little differently than I did at the Tennessee conference. Um, at the conference itself, I dealt with only my personal experience of getting a service dog, which is through an agency. So I want to add this time through advice of somebody else that wrote in, which I appreciate, um, other ways that you can also get a service dog. So the question is, can you train your own service dog? Under the ADA, people with disabilities do have the right to train their own service animals and are not required to use a professional service dog training program. There is no legal service animal certification as of September 12th of 2018. However, as we talk about this, it doesn't mean you can just take any old pet out, call it a service dog, have it misbehave and think that you're gonna be able to bring it into various places. It's important that you have a well-trained animal to be accepted into, a, let's say, a restaurant, into a airplane and so on. So what is a definition of a service dog? Service dogs under the ADA are an animal that is defined as a dog that has been individually trained to do work or perform tasks for an individual with a disability. The tasks performed by the dog must be related to the person's disability. Work or task, the dog must be trained for a specific action when needed to assist a person with a disability. The service dog I'm going to share with you that I've had since 2009, her name is Maggie. When people ask me, she ended up doing something that I will share with you that was never expected and not trained for, and that is she actually monitors my oxygen levels. She's not an alert dog, but turned herself into one. So if somebody doubts me because at this time I'm no longer in a wheelchair, so people look at me and assume I'm just training her, um, and they say, well, what could she possibly do for you? The first thing I say is she keeps me alive because she monitors my breathing, and that pretty much keeps people quiet. So what are the requirements for a service dog. Number one, uh, to identify and understand what type of dog you have. This is if you're going to select a dog and try to train it for yourself or have hire somebody to train for you. 
any dog breed is totally serviced for work and you do not have to have a specific type of dog. Second of all, you find a trainer that you trust or you decide to train the dog for yourself. This is if you choose not to do what I did, which is to use an agency. Number three, train your service dog. Fourth would be to go through public test access testing. And five, have the certification and equipment available with you. Now, how does a dog become a service dog? First step is to know what the requirements and laws are for the service dog. Title II and Title III of the ADA define service animals and any dog that's trained, as I said before, to perform a task for the benefit of the person with a disability. It can include physical, sensory, psychiatric, intellectual, or emotional disability. Based on the ADA's ruling in 1990, dogs that provide a professional service to animals, uh, to, excuse me, to individuals with disabilities that require their support will be allowed access to public places when accompanying their handlers. This is not limited to seeing eye dogs as commonly believed. So Maggie, who I will introduce you to shortly, has literally been in the White House. The really cool thing is I could not do stairs at the time, so we actually had to take the service elevator in the kitchen to get upstairs in the White House, which was really neat, and got to meet the Secret Service and people we never would have met. So you're gonna have experiences with a service dog that take you into locations that are different than usual. Um, she's been in hotels, planes, trains, and I'll show you pictures of those various things. So step one, if you're choosing not to use an organization and you're choosing to either train a dog yourself or hire somebody to, would be number one, identify the understanding what type of dog you have. Again, any dog breed is suitable from golden retrievers, Labradors, German Shepherds, bully breeds, poodles, huskies, and so on. All types of dogs are eligible to become a service dog. They, the laws do not include dog breed restrictions or weight discrimination. If you don't know the breed of your dog, you can require a simple DNA tests if that's gonna provide you more information that you would need. You're gonna identify and understand what type of dog you have continued. You should be aware of your dog's health conditions to confirm the age and the health of your dog is gonna be suitable for the job and to prevent adding strains to the service animal's health and also to, your, to you with your condition. It's important to test your dog's personality, make sure that he, he or she has a good temperament for service work. Dogs who are aggressive or easily scared may not work as service dogs until their public temperament improves. Moving on, step two is to find a trainer you trust or train the dog yourself. You can either adopt a trained service dog from a reputable trainer and bring to your, uh, your dog to a trainer. It's your choice. Did you know that you can train your dog yourself under the service dog laws? In the United States at this time, there are no ADA certification for service animal training. The community itself is self-regulated and includes minimum government regulated standards for training. If you find that you would rather train your dog yourself, you're not only welcome to do it, but it can also help increase the bond between you and your service animal. Step three would be actually training the dog. Most of the time would be spent on this, putting in enough time to train your future service dog is a crucial step. While the United States has no minimum requirement, international standards suggest, suggest approximately 120 hours or over six months of training. Just to give you an idea, the dog I have that came from Needs was trained for 18 months before she was matched with me. It is recommended that at least 30 of these hours should be spent in public to help train the dog in moments of distraction and any surprises that come their way. The most important task you teach your, your service dog is tasking or learning specific skill that will be performing to help assist you with your disability. Some tasks may include a sensing of a medical alert, tactical stimulation during a panic att attack, or grounding or blocking in public areas. We'll explain that in a bit. Step four is the public access test. Once you feel your service dog is trained, then it's time to put them to the test. Below is a quick list of the most important criteria for your service dog to pass. It cannot have aggressive behavior. I have unfortunately came across a dog that was in training that was brought into a physical therapy appointment and I had to take my service dog who is not aggressive at all because they're not trained to be that and close the door in the office because this dog was so aggressive towards my dog. 
normally you'll see service dogs are very calm and very gentle. So aggressive behavior is not gonna work. Um, uh, see sniffing behaviors unless released to do so. No solicitation of food for affection. Overexcitement and hyperactivity in public. These are all things that you would want to work on before you get your dog tested. And then uh, the public asset test is provided by the uh, the PDF form for your convenience. So you can look this up and get a copy of that test. And step five, certification and equipping. In the United States, service dog certification and identification is not a requirement. Unfortunately, many public employees and places do still ask for it. I personally carry Maggie's identification. I am always prepared. I have her list of her medical records along with her identification from needs just in case somebody asks me, but you'll find when a service dog is properly trained and calm, that generally people won't hassle you because they can see by the behavior of the dog that you have a dog that's truly doing its job. But for your convenience, it's a good practice to offer to present these documents that can help show that your dog is a trained service dog if, if need be. Some once in a while they get that stubborn person that really still needs to see, see identification. Very rarely has that ever been asked of me. Um, this helps prevent situations where you, are, um, where you are met with hostility when traveling with your service dog. And trust me, if your service dog's behaving, very rarely will this happen. I have had times when I've gone into a restaurant, maybe, maybe for the first time with a dog, they look at me and say, oh no, we don't allow dogs in here. I, under, I explain to them, this is a service dog. Um, they said, well, no, we don't allow it. I said, well, I need to let you know that I'm not gonna make a scene, is what I say. And um, you can go speak to your manager. I uh, just want you to know if you do not let me in that you are actually break, breaking a federal law because she's a true service dog. That usually gets me a seat in, in about two minutes from the manager because um, sometimes they just don't understand that. And generally, Maggie will go lay down under the table. People in the restaurant don't even realize she's there by the time we get up and walk back out because these dogs are so appropriate. So electing to carry a custom service dog ID, service dog vest might be a simpler solution for you and your service dog. It, you may also choose not to carry the ID and stand your ground on principle when you encounter people ignoring the service dog rights. It's a choice you have to make of how you want to handle this. Step five, certif certification and equipment. Continued after you verbally confirm that your dog is trained, service dog or documentation is shown, Reasonable accommodations must be legally made for your service dogs. Service dogs provide help for those facing physical or mental disabilities, so they are granted access to public hotels, restaurants, malls, and so on. It's important to understand these steps to help you and those around you. So don't feel embarrassed. I have taken Maggie absolutely everywhere with me. There are two places that you must get permission for only in this country with a service dog. One is a private home. You must have permission to go into that home if there's any question about that. And the strange thing is the second one is a military base. You must uh, ask for permission onto a military base. Otherwise, that service dog um, has permission to go everywhere you go. And when I'm on a plane, you'll see in a minute a picture of her. She sleeps literally at my feet on the plane. So what can be asked of you about a service dog? Number one, they can ask you, is the dog a service animal required because of the disability? If you say yes, then the second question they can only ask is, what work or task has the dun been trained to perform? The dog, excuse me, not the dun. Um, those are, that's it, that's what they're allowed to ask you. They don't have to ask about your disability. They, they should not be asking you personal questions. Um, they cannot, docu uh, documentation does not have to be requested. The dog does not have to demonstrate it, tasks for somebody else. And if the di disability is obvious, the person cannot be asked what the disability is. So I'm now going to focus on the difference of taking a dog that has been trained by organization instead. When I chose to get a service dog back in 2009, I had met a young girl in our state, the only person at the time I met that had Eller Stanlos, and she had a service dog. Um, we had a dog that was getting old and being about to be put down. Um, I was in a wheelchair, I was not doing well. I had been having a number of surgeries for my legs at that point and was and really not doing well at all. And I was nervous about it, but thought, well, maybe this would be the answer to get a service dog in my life that could help me. 
but I felt like maybe I'm not bad enough, maybe I don't deserve this, uh, what happens if I don't pass? And it became kind of a stressful thing to wonder if, if I should even be applying, am I being selfish? I didn't know how to feel about it. Um, so I'm gonna tell you the story of how I got, this is the picture of my Maggie who now is 11 and is about to be retired within the year. I've had to go through it another second interview um, to replace her with a new service dog. Just so you know, it's breaking my heart to even think about leaving her home someday, but you do keep your service dogs after you are done with them um, and they get to stay home and retire with you. But it still is hard for me to imagine not to have her by my side. Um, so if you use an organization similar to needs, and there's many different organizations out there, these dogs are taken from their parents when they're around six weeks old. They're sent to what's called a puppy house for needs to observe their behavior. Then they are, if they seem to be looking like their potential service dogs, and only 40% of them actually make it to the full range of being a service dog. The one I was supposed to be matched with failed its very last week of training and became too distracted with other dogs around and got nudged down to becoming a therapy dog and went to a child in the state that has autism and literally turned that child's life around. Um, but did not qualify to stay as a service dog. So if they pass the puppy house screening, then they are sent to a prison to live and train from Monday through Friday. And then on the weekends, a volunteer um, puppy raiser comes, puppy trainer comes and picks the dog up on the weekends and brings it back and takes the weekend to socialize the dog out in life to try to get them used to it. Um, service dogs are trained to pick up dropped items to retrieve objects off the tables and the counters, like maybe you need your phone. Um, they can turn off light switches on and off. They can push the automatic door buttons on those heavy doors for us, which are wonderful. I have a rope on my refrigerator. She tugs at the refrigerator door. She can open cabinets. Um, and one of the funniest things is they, they bark, not they bark when they play, but otherwise these dogs are very quiet and they will bark on command as a source of help for you. When I first came home with a service dog, um, I realized it was just not me learning how to use it. My husband had to learn too. He was, we were living on a farm at the time and he went outside on the farm and I was in the wheelchair and I needed help. So I had Maggie start barking to get his attention. He came in about an hour later. I said, gee, did you hear Maggie? He said, yeah, I heard her barking. That's so weird. I said, and I had to remind him that meant I kind of needed your help. Um, so it's a whole family adjustment when you bring a dog home to all learn to work around these commands and, and what they're supposed to mean. So most um, needs dogs are um, purposely bred. The dogs are tested for temperament, health, behavior, history. Puppies are eight to 10 weeks old when they're taken. Right now, they tend to be mostly black and yellow labs. Um, guiding eyes for the blind it takes the more aggressive looking ones. The quieter ones tend to go towards needs for service dogs. Some become hearing dogs, for sh um, and those, many of those come from actually from the shelters for hearing dogs from needs. Uh, we don't need this picture in here, but I thought it was so adorable. This is just the early learning center at needs a picture of some of the puppies that are in the process of being trained to someday possibly be a, a service dog. When they go off to the prison, 95% um, of the needs dogs are trained in these prisons in New England. Needs expert trainers, uh, they come and train these prisoners. It's a very elite, wonderful program in the prison. Um, very select prisoners meet the criteria. They provide consistent training due to the free time during the week and profound effect on these inmates. Many of these people who get selected to work with these needs dogs end up going out in society when they're done with their sentence and they go out and find jobs working with animals, which is really exciting. So it's, it's a very elite program for them. This is just a picture of, of a prisoner working with a puppy. When you get selected to get a service dog, um, you get, um, the call, what a, it's just recently changed. She told me it used to be that I, last time I got a call and within a week I was to report to needs with other people, live on campus for two weeks to train with my service dog. Now they give you a full month. They send you pictures of the dog and the name and the whole bit. So you have a little more time. You live in a, in a group setting um, at 
this particular spot where it's handicap accessible. Um, you do hands-on training with the dogs. You take literally take field trips into the stores, into restaurants. They want to try to mimic all the different um, possible situations you might be, be in so you understand how to work with the dog with them. And the funny thing is you have to catch up to the dog. If you do it this way, these dogs are already trained. It's you catching up to the skills they have and learning to take the skills that they have to work with and how to um, accommodate them to the needs that you would have. Um, we have educational classes, including medical care and grooming. Maggie gets groomed every day um, because she's out in public all the time. I not only brush her every day, I wipe her down with a wet cloth to get as much of the dander off of her too. So you wanna keep these dogs as clean as possible. And they're very careful about the weight of the dog. She has measured food that she gets in the morning and at night, and then I have food in my pocket at all times. So when she does a, uh, a command, she gets a piece of her dog food. Um, I, years ago, used to give our dogs, our pet dogs, scrap food. That's not um, something we do with, with these dogs. It's very important that we keep them on the diet, keep them slender. Um, Maggie's brother, who happened to train at the same time with me, um, went home to his wounded warrior in New Jersey, and he proceeded to not listen to that and start feeding his dog all sorts of wonderful food. The dog got very heavy. They do check you out once or twice a year and found Houdini, which is his name, um, overweight and told him he had two months to get the weight down or they would consider taking the dog back. So they take this very seriously. These dogs have had a lot of people putting time into them. So that really matters to them that they keep these dogs um, healthy and clean. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, weekend puppy raisers are committed volunteers that open up their hearts and homes to these puppies. Uh, they're assigned dogs for a duration um, that the dog is in the prison. They teach uh, house manners, socialization, and training. They visit grocery stores, movie theaters, just about everything you go do, you bring this trained dog with you. Um, and moving on, I'd like you to introduce you to my Maggie. Um, this was taken when she was first trained and she and I were meeting each other. And this is a picture of Maggie and I meeting for the first time. They try very hard to not have the dog bond with anybody until they meet their match. They're very, very careful with a very long interview. It's at least a two hour interview to listen to you, to measure you, your height, you know, how far down you can reach and so on, to try to get a dog the appropriate size and the pro appropriate behavior to help you out with your disability. So let me run through some of the things that we did in those two weeks of training. This is Maggie showing me at the time I was wheelchair bound. This is Maggie showing me how she, through command, can turn a light switch on and off. When you can't get up out of that wheelchair safely, it's a wonderful thing to have on. If you notice on the right-hand side, you'll see this green leash. For those two weeks that I, Maggie and I trained together, she was literally tethered to my wheelchair and with me at all times. Four of us stayed in the same house together. We each had a service dog. They were not even allowed to play together at that time. Um, they all slept quietly under the table when we ate, and they just focused us on bonding with our dogs and not having them socialize with other animals at the time. Um, since then, they're all good friends. This is a picture of us learning how to get in and out of a van on a wheelchair. Here's a picture of all of us, in fact, the white lab on the right, that's Houdini, which happens to be Maggie's brother. Um, this is us going into a restaurant and getting the feel of what it's like to walk around with a service dog. This is us going through a local street. If you look behind me, you'll see uh, my buddy who has Houdini, her brother. Um, I don't know if he gave the command and gave him permission to be pet or not. Generally, a service dog is going to ignore other people except you. Unless you say, if I want Maggie to socialize, I'll say, Maggie, say hello. Say hello over there or where there, and she'll know that's meaning it's okay to go over and wag her tail and get loved up. Otherwise, she will just um, wait for me to give her a command with that outfit on. This is a picture of her opening a door. You'll notice there's a rope on the door. So there's many different things you can do with these service animals to get the help that you need. On the right-hand side, she was being tested. This was her trainer, Erin, who had spent many months with her, but now that Maggie was being matched with me, 
What she was trying to do was distract Maggie away from my command. My command was to was down and stay. And she tried as hard as she could, and Maggie listened and stayed in that position until I gave her a new command. So the bonding had already begun. And this is just another of her picture of lights on and off. We stayed on campus, and wherever you go, if you're going to be um, getting a service dog, there's various circumstances in terms of housing. Um, all the dogs came to us. None of them have ever been on furniture. All four of us that trained together totally cheated the first night we had our dogs with us. We all invited them up on the bed to get close to them. I invited her up and woke up at four, uh, uh, I think it was two in the morning with her still plastered in what it's called spooning, laying against the side of me, uh, next to me through the night, which was pretty darn special and a very wonderful feeling. When you go to training like this with a service dog, they do allow you to go home the first weekend, bring your service dog home with you, introduce the dog to the family. So this is Maggie meeting my husband, and this was Maggie meeting the dog we had at the time, Bear. Um, and it was really, it's really nice. We have another uh, rescue dog in our house right now, and it's nice that Maggie has a playmate. Um, she's not always working, although whatever I do, she's always keeping an eye on me but it's nice that she has time so she can play with other animals and be a dog too. This just happens to sh uh, show you a picture. This is uh, Maggie and us on the right, and next to her is her brother Houdini, and this is Wendy and Karen that have their dogs here. And we've all, when you go through a program like this, you kind of become very bonded with these people. So not only did I gain Maggie as a service dog, but I gained these three other friends and we've had many times we've actually gotten together and had our dogs all play together. So how did she make my life easier? She opens the refrigerator and inside the refrigerator, I put my medicine in this pack that goes right in the door there. She's able to open the door with that and then hand me the medication. To give you an idea of how attentive these dogs are, one night I went to go to bed, I found her sitting in front of the refrigerator. I called her to the bed and she didn't move. I called her a second time. She sat on the floor and did not move. I turned to my husband, I remember saying it, I said, oh my gosh, she's turning into a bratty teenager already. And then it dawned on me, I had forgotten to take my medication. Maggie was not allowing me to go to bed until I came back into that kitchen, commanded her to open that door and get the medicine out. So I was pretty impressed. I really have to listen to her more than I realized. Um, because when you're in a wheelchair or you have trouble bending with our condition, she picks up her own bowl and command. She picks up pieces of paper, pens. One of the funniest things when I first came home with her, again with my husband, was he has a tendency to take a shower at that time and drop everything on the floor and go and take the shower. And all of a sudden that day I'm getting socks and underwear and pants and she brought absolutely everything he had dropped onto the floor into me and uh, it was hysterical so we, i've had to train my husband to remember to put things up on the sink now instead because with a service dog you get them a reward for doing something good so she every time she was doing this she was getting a piece of food and i had to be very careful not to let her get overweight so we corrected that with my husband at the time when i got maggie this isn't the greatest picture in the world but this is um me in a hospital bed this is a air mattress that at the time i was using I would, at the time I had two leg braces, I would get the braces all the way off, and then suddenly remember I'd forgotten to press the button down here to turn the air mattress on. I'd have to put my braces all the way back on, get off the bed, bend down. So I took her, her skills and taught her to train with her nose, to turn either her nose or her paw, to hit the button and turn the air mattress on for me. So I never had to worry about putting everything back on again for making that mistake or forgetting. And this is just a picture of Maggie. Um, to give you a quick story, when I first came home with her six days later, I would not have been here anymore. Uh, it was Thanksgiving morning. It was four in the morning. I woke up about, and I kept thinking, why is this dog laying on top of my chest? At that time, when she came home with me, her command was to be on the floor next to the bed, but it felt like she was lying on top of my chest. I finally opened my eyes and realized she was next to me. She had jumped up onto the hospital bed 
and was working to reposition my head to get the airflow back. If that, that tube you're looking at is a BiPAP machine, which is like a home respirator, it forces air in and pulls it back out. And despite having that machine on, my sternum um, was slipping in at the time, my trachea and hyoid bones move, and it can cut off breathing. She somehow had sensed this. She had not been trained to be an alert dog, jumped up on the bed, repositioned my body, and brought the airflow back in and saved my life. Um, then the doctor said, let's not wait for her to jump on the bed. Let's have her sleep between you. So if we spent years of Maggie sleeping between my husband and I, I cannot, in this picture, have her do what she's doing there. She can no longer get on top of my body at all because my body's so vulnerable that the chest will just cave in. Um, the past year with her aging, she's now sleeping on the floor by choice, which breaks my heart a little bit, which tells me I know that she's ready for retirement. She's getting older. This is a picture of us when we go to the pool. I used to be a master swimmer. I can't use my neck and my arms anymore because of the fusions. However, I am able to kick in the water. Maggie, because we started with her with me in a wheelchair, takes the um, cards on command, delivers behind the desk here to the woman, and goes back after we work out and gets the cards back again. And she loves doing this. This is a picture of me on the Hoya lift, getting ready to go into the pool. Maggie helps me when I, um, various items, whether it's handing me my shoes or taking them away from me or pulling my socks off, whatever I need to have done, she's there to help me out and loves to help out. On the right-hand side, you see Maggie at the end of the lane. This is her figuring it out on her own. She lays there and she will go to sleep until she decides my oxygen levels are starting to go down. When that happens, I don't know how she figured this out. She'll go from being sound asleep to looking at me when I come at the end of the lane, starting to stare with me. One time I, I thought, well, I'll just push it for one more lap. What the heck? I know I don't feel great, but what's one more lap? I did the one more lap. I came back. She had gone from a command of laying down to sitting up, backing up like she was getting ready to jump in the pools. In other words, get the heck out. So from this point on, after that experience, when she starts to look at me and she wakes up like that, I get out of the pool because I know she knows almost better than I do. This is Maggie playing. She's uh, 10 in this picture. She's playing with a, uh, a four-year-old. This is when she first met the puppy at four months, and now this dog's four years old over here, and she's able to keep up with him, which is amazing. So it's really important with however you train your dog, have it trained, or you get one from one of these organizations, keep the dog as slender as you can to keep them as healthy as you can. This is us traveling. This is um, Maggie at my feet on a plane. This is her carrying the tickets when we're heading off on a train ride. And this is us for, I've had 24 surgeries. Um, this is in Wisconsin. I, I live in Rhode Island, but I was flying out to Wisconsin a lot at that time because there was an orthopedic surgeon that understood Ehlers-Danlos and was using uh, cadaver tendons on me to help me get my legs back. And I, I was shocked that they allowed Maggie all the way into the waiting room for surgery, the holding room, and this is her saying goodbye before I was going to go into the surgery. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is me, but now in the room and Maggie being allowed to not only be in the hospital, but live in my room with me. Normally they tell you that you are responsible to take care of your dog. I received a call from this particular hospital. It's West Dallas, they are wonderful there. Called me up to say, listen, there's gonna be a time you're not gonna be up to it. We have a list of people that have signed up that would like to volunteer to take your dog out. And then what they did for me is when it was time for me to feel strong enough, they actually, didn't even charge me, got me an electric wheelchair so I could take Maggie in and out on my own, which was amazing. These people were so kind. And this is just a picture of Maggie being allowed up on the hospital bed, in the hospital, comforting me. Um, it, it's, it's hard to explain. Those of you that love animals can get it. It's just something so magical. Um, sometimes when I'm stressed, I don't even realize I'm doing it, that I just would reach down and I I, I just rub her ears between my fingers, and there's something so comforting about that. I don't know why, but it is. And she doesn't mind it at all. She loves to be touched. She somehow figured out that we were having problems drawing my blood, typical EDSer. And uh, one day she just decided to climb up under here, and she did this herself. 
Um, and every time they came in to do any kind of blood work with me, she would do this and would help elevate the arm up. And actually the nurse loved it because it was very beneficial in drawing the blood out. And this is for the first time um, since I had had Maggie that we were on, I was on my legs and we were walking out of that Wisconsin hospital together, which was pretty exciting. Maggie's gone with me to advocate. If you'll see her holding the sign here, um, and we do different presentations. And here's two dogs right here, both mind, minding their own business. They did not socialize with each other. They took the command that they were given and both stayed there as we were doing our presentations. And this is just another picture in the state house. Um, and Maggie is on my lap, but that's by command. If I say my lap, she will jump up and put her paws onto my lap, but she would never just jump on me without permission. This is Maggie and I, uh, we were at a summer camp training children, I realized, which is why we wrote the book, the book about my life as a service dog. A lot of people don't understand the benefits of a service animal. So it's a wonderful opportunity to help educate other people and understand what they're able to do to help your life. This is her in DC. This is us with more speaking engagements and she's just always there by my side. And basically, this is literally the best decision I've ever made in my life to have a surf dog. Like I said, I was scared. I didn't know if I could handle the responsibility. I didn't know if I could handle taking care of her. Um, I just need to tell you if that part scares you too, and to how you would take care of a dog. Um, one thing it does for you is it makes you live your life a little bit more than you might have thought to live it, because you have to take care of that dog. They teach people who are paraplegics in these organizations how to take care of a service dog. So don't get scared about that part. They will help you with that and you will figure out what works for you. And as far as the money goes, that's scary. I called them up the day after my first interview for Maggie and cried and said, I think I need to have you take my name off the list. I don't know where I would possibly come up with $8,000 if I can't um, raise it. And they said, joking around, oh, we're going to get the guillotine out, and basically said, you know, we're just asking you to try to raise the money, at least cover the cost of this service dog. Let us help you. They, they set up a whole website for you, your picture, your story, and we put it in the local grocery store. I put it on Facebook, sent it off to friends. I was shocked in, in four months, Maggie was totally paid for. We never put a penny out. I then, in June, had a second interview for replacing Maggie as a service dog and I have to start out all over again. And unfortunately, it's another $8,000. I thought, what am I gonna do? I just have to tell you that it's totally been paid for in two months. People you don't even know are gonna look at your story and they're gonna wanna help you. I'm finding the local grocery store is one of the best things within your community. I ended up writing thank you notes to people I didn't know from a hole in the wall that just saw the posting and wanted to help out. So, I don't know if we have any questions. Do we have any questions, Sarah, that you can give me? Yes, we do. We have a couple questions in. Um, but first off, I want to thank you so much um, for a fantastic webinar. It was extremely informative. Oh, good. Um, thank you. So just a reminder, if anybody else has questions, the question box is still open. Um, but one of the first questions we're going to start with is how do you personally respond to negative interactions with others with your service dog? Well, you know, now that I'm out of a wheelchair and I don't have any braces on me for the first time in years, um, I get those comments once in a while. How could you possibly need a service dog or what could possibly be wrong with you? And like I said, I think the one thing that I quickly say to them, and it's not telling a lie, is that Maggie has kept me alive and knows when my breathing, my oxygen levels are low. She's not an alert dog, but she turned herself into that. That right there keeps somebody quiet. They never ask another word after I mention that. But, you know, there's, whether it's a handicap sticker for parking or whatever, we all go through this judgment because one minute we're in a wheelchair, the next minute we might be stepping out of our wheelchair because we can walk a little bit, but not a long distance, and we get judged for that. We just have to learn to put a crust around us and protect ourselves and feel confident that we deserve this. And I, I, I really doubted myself whether I deserve to have a service dog. But yet, 
think about it. I wouldn't even be having this conversation with you if I didn't have Maggie in my life. I wouldn't have been alive. I would have been gone. So I'm so glad I got past that little paranoia. Do I deserve this? Um, and just be honest with people. You know, share what the service dog can do for you how she picks things up and you have trouble bending. And if you bend and twist that, you know, you're, you might sublux out and, and people just can't understand and it's not their fault what's wrong with us and why it is life can be so vulnerable. So it's, it's a nice educational opportunity to respond to that in a positive way. I hope that helps. That's a fantastic answer and a fantastic reminder that it, it, it is hard to deal with people sometimes, but education and being positive is definitely the best way to handle it. Now, to go off that question, about how long did it take Maggie to pick up on your oxygenation levels? <laughs> uh, not very long, because I brought her home. We did two weeks of training in Princeton, Mass., which is where Needs is located. We came home, and it was six days later, I would have been gone. So she picked it up pretty darn quickly. I have no idea how or why, but again, like I said, they don't let the dog bond until they match you. And that is part of the magic. If she had bonded with somebody else first and then got me next, maybe she wouldn't have picked it up as quickly, but she somehow seemed to understand I was her mission and it was immediate. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That's really special. She's, she's a wonderful dog. Sure is. <laughs> now, another question about issues with service dogs. Um, a couple people have mentioned that zoos seem to be notorious for trying to refuse service dogs, citing that it disrupts the other animals. How would you deal with the situation if you were presented with that argument? Well, I've been at a zoo and what I did is I walked in to where you check in. I said, I'm here with my service dog. She is with me. And what they have done, and you might suggest this to the zoo you go to, is they called to the staff to say, we have a service dog coming through the facility, just so you know. And Maggie walked around with me. If I felt that the animals were getting upset, what I did with her was lay her down in a down position, a little bit farther away from those animals. And you know that's something you can suggest that if it looks like something's upset, then just offer to have your dog lay down. Um, and not walk up to the, you know, I, I didn't have her go up and sniff the animals out at all. I, she was by my side. She's not loose. She's, you know, tethered to me on a leash. So um, if that becomes an issue, I think that would be the one kind offer. Or the other thing you might want to suggest that what this Capron Zoo does is they have, they literally call the staff to let them know a service dog is coming through the facility. I, I was very impressed with how they handled that. So technically you are allowed in that zoo with that dog, but I'm sure you all will be appropriate to not let the dog go running up to a cage and scaring the animals. And their service dogs don't go barking at other things. That's why they were selected to get to this level of, you know, they are the top of the line. And that's because they have appropriate behaviors. So that dog's gonna do what you command them to do. If you want that dog to sit, that dog's gonna sit. If you say down and lay down and stay, it's gonna do that. So, you know, you just show them you have control of that dog and, and I think they will get confident with that. And it's really nice for you to be maybe the first person going into that zoo with a service animal. Chances are you won't be the first, but if you are, at least you can show them what we do appropriately with these animals that we're not there to be disrupted, that we're there to be safe with our own medical issues. Okay? Wonderful, thank you so much. Now we've gotten this question a couple of times. At what point in your life did you decide it was time for a service dog? And where do you think um, our attendees should be focusing their thoughts on whether or not they should get a service dog? Um, like I said at the beginning, I met a young girl in the state that had a service dog. I honestly had never even thought about it. I used to work in a zoo as an animal keeper back in high school and college. I've always loved animals. I've always had pets all my life. Um, but I was getting pretty scared and lonely and frightened with my condition and not a lot of medical help at the time back in 2009. And I just, when I saw her with that dog, I thought maybe, maybe this could help me. And it was the best decision in the world to have something open up a handicap heavy door to, to get things for me. I mean, think about it. She wouldn't let me go to bed because I forgot to take medication. I mean, it's like, you have this guardian angel walking, watching everything you do. Uh, you know, she's, when I 
it's a simple little thing. When I go into the bathroom, she comes in from a sound sleep, walks into the bathroom, stands there, politely waits, and then when it's time for me to get up, I can put my hand between uh, her, her, just below her neck, between the, you know, the legs there, and just for a little extra balancing. And she loves to do that to help me. So it just, it just, it just felt right that maybe it was okay to have this and not, I, I, I don't know why I felt being selfish, thinking I should or shouldn't have a dog, but I, for some reason I put myself through that. And I don't want you guys to do that to yourself. Everybody, um, unless, unless you, and I'll share two things in a minute about particularly needs. It's, you know, they, these dogs are there to help you. They want you to have this help. And people with Ellers Danlos, at least at needs, are finding that they tend to get approved. However, there are two things if you say to them, they're gonna tell you they can't do this for you. One is these needs does not do balanced dogs. So that if you see a large dog with a harness on it, that's for balance and those are amazing, wonderful dogs. They do not train for that. However, I just gave an example of how Maggie has helped me with balance. When I get up off the chair, when I get off the toilet, she's right there for me. Um, the other thing they do not want to take on is, is asking for the dog to be an alert dog. Maggie's turned into that on her own. I have no idea how it happened, but they don't take the responsibility with the dogs they train at needs to become alert animals. There are organizations, and I can't think of it for the life of me, there's one in Pennsylvania that does alert dogs. There's a wonderful movie out right now. A woman I met at, at the conference suggested I watch it. Um, Adele and Everything After is the name of it. It's a documentary of a woman who got an alert dog for cardiac issues. And this dog would help her and let her know that she was about to pass out so she could get on the floor and be safe instead of falling down. Um, so there are organizations that do train dogs specifically for that too. Uh, did I answer your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think it is. I, I think it's while it is good to have recommendations for you, it's also a very individualized case to see when you need a, a service dog. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, definitely, I know needs specifically respects Ellers Danlos is all over the place. I went for my interview. I'm not in a wheelchair and I don't have a brace on. And I got approved for a second service dog because they understand that our lives are up and down like yo-yos. And they get that. Um, I don't know if every organization understands or, you know, Ellers Danlos as much as this particular one does or not. I'm guessing there's so many of us out there, they probably do. But, um, you know, don't, don't feel like you don't deserve to have this help and this companionship because it will totally enrich your life. And you will be trained on how to take care of this dog. I know that's a very scary part. You feel lousy. I'm in a wheelchair, how am I gonna get outside and take care of this dog? And they will help you on learning how to do that. That's part of the specific training on how to handle this with your disability, okay? Alrighty, thank you so much. Uh, we've got a certain scenario that one of our attendees has found themselves in. Um, what advice would you give a person whose partner is against them having a quote unquote pet in a flat in the city when you think a service dog could be very beneficial to you? I love pets, but that's not the same thing as a service dog. A service dog is part of you. It's part of your arms, it's part of your legs, it's part of your thinking process. So I don't think you can compare a pet to a service animal. A service animal is performing tasks to help you live your life with better quality. So I would love to talk to that partner and help them understand what it's done for my life. And I'm offering to that person, if they would like me to talk to them, I'd be more than happy to, to help explain the difference of having a pet versus having this animal. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. And uh, just to go off that, you have your email up on the screen. Yeah. Now. So Absolutely. it's perfectly fine for people to reach out and ask you Absolutely. questions that might not have been covered? Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, much appreciated. Um, we've got what looks like one last question. Okay. And to you, what is the most difficult part to having a service dog? <laughs> Probably right now. The thought that I have to, uh, two things, uh, don't, don't laugh at this. When I went through the training, um, the first day we sat down and got educated and they said, if you lose your life in the first three months, your spouse or partner, whatever, would need to bring the dog back to them 
and they would have to evaluate the dog and decide if they were going to place it with another handicapped person. I immediately burst out crying. I thought you want my husband to possibly lose me and then have to bring Maggie back. I said, are you serious? I said, how much loss can we take? And they listened to me and the next day came up to me and said, you know, we thought about what you said and we promised you we would not do that to you. Because at that time, I didn't know if I was going to keep living. Um, so now the opposite's happening and that is it's time for me to have to consider retiring Maggie. And that's the other thing that I know this probably isn't the answer you expected to hear, but it's really bothering me about all these years. She's been by my side through these surgeries, hospitalizations, traveling everywhere we've gone. Maggie's been with me at all times. So the thought of me someday commanding her to stay home and walk out the door with another dog is killing me. I, I've just, I write for National Pain Report and I have an article about it out right now because it's really hard for me to imagine my life without Maggie by my side. But if you get a chance to see the documentary, Adele and everything after, what helped me with that is the ending and it shows her coming home with the new dog because she had all the same fears I did of how she was going to handle this and how the dog could handle it. And then she walks in the dog door with the new dog the two dogs instantly become bonded and friends and it all works out. And I needed to see that because I cried through the entire movie because it's bothering me. This, this is, she's my lifeline. So the thought of not having her be my side is really hard to handle. And um, I guess I need to be grateful that I survived all these years because of her. But I think when you have a dog alerting you and giving you help, you just want to be sure that the next dog can do possibly what she's been doing for me. If that makes any sense, did I answer that okay? That's completely understandable. Okay. <laughs> One last question. Yes. Was there ever a point, either in the beginning of training with Maggie or any time throughout the time you've spent with her, that you had an inkling of regret and maybe this was too much for you to handle? The first week of training, I felt horrible physically. I was in that wheelchair. I was really in bad shape. And I was doing horrible in the training, I mean, really badly, to the point that by the second week when she and I suddenly bonded, so I don't know what happened, something magical happened. And from that point on, we were partners. And I don't even know what happened, but she must have picked up on what I was going through and we just bonded together. But I honestly, they were concerned too, because that needs, if you go through that organization, you do get a little testing at the end and you have to pass it to show that you know how to handle this dog and bring it back home. A lot of people have invested a lot of time in it. And they were questioning if I was gonna to pass too that first week. By the second week, we, were, we went through everything and we bonded, but it was exhausting. I'm not gonna to lie to you because I was so unwell at that time. Um, and it was, it was just kind of stressful because I, I, I wasn't feeling good. And here I was learning how to deal with this dog. I love animals, but she was so advanced compared to me. I, I had so much catching up and, and we as a family had actually raised a guiding eyes puppy years ago. Um, one of my sons had used it at his college, you know, getting ready for college and, and we raised this puppy and he was able to, you know, report that on his college applications and the commands were different. So at nighttime, when I take Maggie outside to go to the bathroom, um, for a service dog at that time, it was you, say, you command them to go to the bathroom, believe it or not. I say, okay, Maggie, you gotta go. And she will sit down, squat, and go to the bathroom. It's hysterical. But it was a different command for the guiding eyes dog. I'd be so exhausted by nighttime. I was giving her the wrong commands. I'm yelling out, what am I supposed to say? I mean, it's just, you know, it is tiring. Um, but it's the best thing I ever did in my life. And do I have regrets? Absolutely no. And the way I can prove that to you is I'm about to go through it again and get a second service dog. Um, so uh, to me, I can't imagine. I had two choices. And one was to wait until Maggie passes. She's now 11. And then get in line and wait, if approved, for another service dog. The wait can be up to a year. Or you make the choice, and they called me about four months ago suggesting I thought about it. You, or you make the choice that you retire your dog when she's still here, you bring the new dog home. And then a lot of what Maggie's going to be already doing for me, hopefully would then be transferred to this new dog. So this new dog will see the, way, the lay of the land in this home and what she does. Um, I've had some people even offer to have both dogs come initially to the pool, um, to various, to a, a, we go to a Unitarian church and, and, and bring both of them in so that 
so Maggie can show the dog what they do. Um, so we probably will take that um, advantage of that only because they suggested it. Technically only one dog will be a real working dog after this. Um, but I think it's a good idea if Maggie could come to the pool, have them both lay down at the end of the lane and let her show her the other dog what she does for me. I think they can communicate in their own dog way. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much, Ellen, but that's all the time we have for, for today. If you'd like more information about anything that was presented today, please check out our website for more resources and information. Ellen also has her, her email up and feel free to contact her with any questions regarding service dogs. Um, and definitely consider signing up for our newsletter if you haven't already. It's a fantastic source for the most up-to-date information and upcoming events. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday, September 18th. We have Jeannie DeBond presenting the No Pain, No Strain strategy to move pain-free with EDS and hypermobility, a look inside the Zebra Club. You can look out for the sign-up on our next webinar shortly. Thank you again so much, Ellen. Your presentation was extremely informative and very helpful. I hope everyone here today learned something that will help them take that next step towards possibly welcoming a service dog into their lives. Technology permitting, this webinar should be available on our YouTube channel within the next week or so. If you found this webinar helpful in any way, please consider hitting that like button once the webinar is available on YouTube and subscribing to our channel so that you can be alerted to when we're uploading videos. Also, there will be a donation button on our main YouTube page, along with a link in the uploaded webinar. It's thanks to donations that allow us to continue to provide programs like our webinars, along with other great projects and research that we're undertaking. Once again, thank you so much, Ellen. Best of luck with your new service dog. Love and scratches to Maggie. And <laughs> everybody else has a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>